Yes, today I'm going to talk about the future of currency, and I'm going to focus mostly on cryptocurrency and blockchain innovations. Um, one of the things that has become interesting about talking about this subject over time is that when I first started speaking about it, a general audience would know almost nothing. Um, today, almost everyone has an opinion about it, uh, which in some ways makes it harder to, to start a conversation since people are coming from very different perspectives. But today, I'm going to sort of start at the beginning. Uh, but hopefully, even for those of you in the audience who are experts, um, some of the perspectives will uh, get you thinking. And then we'll have a discussion starting around 10.15 where we can take it in all sorts of different directions. So I got interested in, in cryptocurrency and blockchain um, back in 2012 and 2013. I had some computer science colleagues who were working on it. And then I also uh, went to various conferences, tech conferences, where a lot of people in Silicon Valley were starting to get interested in it. And you might hear uh, uh, someone say at one of these uh, sort of tech elite conferences something like, I was you know, employee number you know, X uh, double digits at Google, and I've now put 20% you know, of my wealth into Bitcoin. This is this great thing. And my first reaction to that was, you guys are bad people. You're doing a Ponzi scheme. Um, how could you be doing this? Uh, this, is not, this is not good. But uh, when I started digging into it and really understanding it, I got very excited about the, the technology and its potential. Um, since then, I uh, joined as an advisor for Ripple. And I'll talk a little bit as, as I go through about what made me initially excited about Ripple and then joined the board a year later bef before their Series A. And now Ripple is, is one of the more successful um, companies in this space, which is really great. And that was founded, um, co-founded by Chris Larson, who's a GSB alum as well. So we've, it, it's a, so we've had a really exciting time with this space. I've, and now I'm teaching a class to the MBAs. We were way over enrolled and had about 100 people in the, in the spring on this topic. The students here at Stanford are also very excited about this space. There's a sort of an informal organization of students that has about 700 people on their mailing list. So it's a really, really exciting area. At the same time, there's a pretty big gap between sort of how many student projects come in from MBAs to engineers with are all excited about what to do with blockchain versus the reality of you know, what's actually going into commercial production. So I'll say it's sometimes hard for me to even to communicate my uh, schizophrenia on this topic, which on the one hand is like fascination and research and teaching and leadership in the area. And on the other hand, for any particular person who's thinking about investing in a company or in a currency, there's still a lot of skepticism that needs to be um, you know, kept, kept into play. So hopefully we'll get the, the, the balanced view of all of these things as we go through. So first of all, I want to talk about, it's actually even using the words is kind of tricky in this area, whether you talk about cryptocurrency, whether you talk about blockchain, actually none of the words are really perfect for describing what's going on. So it's more about like the thing that you're doing rather than the terminology. But there's really um, you know, a, a bunch of different ways to think about what cryptocurrency is. And one reason that can actually be difficult to have a, a conversation around it is that everyone has a different idea in their head and people start talking across purposes. So you know, one, one thing to think about with cryptocurrency is it's a way to store value. Um, it's sort of like digital gold. And that, that's, there's a group of people who are very strong on that use case. And that, that's a use case that's happening, especially you know, if you're a billionaire and you've sort of diversified in all of these different uh, assets and you have your, you know, your house in New Zealand and you have your bunker, you know, um, why not you know, put 10% of your assets into something like Bitcoin and then the keys are actually stored in bunkers around the world and it helps you kind of protect yourself. But it's actually, you know, it's, it's actually sort of a cumbersome way for a typical person to try to, to hedge. Um, but for security reasons and also just for, for there's, there's a lot of technological um, impediments. 
Um, as an asset class, I'll, I'll probably won't have time to show you too much on the statistics, but it is kind of an interesting asset class because it's, it's um, not that correlated with other traditional asset classes. And so it, it, it's even in the short term when you're not worrying about the world blowing up in some way, you know, it does uh, provide sort of a differentiated type of, of, uh, of asset. Um, the, the thing that, that sort of got me most interested in the beginning is the idea that it can be used as a payment system. Now, it, it's going to turn out that it's pretty hard to make a new payment system. And if you're, if you're in an economy that has a pretty well-functioning payment system, it's really not going to provide a lot of benefit. You know, I've had students come into my office for you know, 15 years saying how they're going to compete with the credit cards. That's just actually a very hard thing to do. The economics of credit cards are pretty hard to enter. It's not about the technology. So you could say the technology is archaic, but you know, the, it's actually the economics that make it a difficult place to enter, not the um, technological improvements. But what one of the places where things are really broken are international payments. Um, and so that's a place where we're seeing um, adoption as well as real economic value um, from, uh, from cryptocurrencies. And then the final thing, which is really where actually most of the, of the sort of engineering teams are really working, is that you know, it's a, really a platform, a technology platform. So especially something like Ethereum is, is built as a sort of a software development system. And, and I'll talk a little bit more about how people are using that. But it, it's really like a technology that's, that's a building block for some other kind of service, some way to a database, some way to store information. And that's where a lot's going on. If anybody's interested more in these application areas, because we, can, we have a relatively short time today, GSB lecturer Doug Galen has written recently a, a very nice paper that surveyed all of the blockchain for good initiatives and it talks about in depth about where the startups are, um, which ones are close to actually you know, having a working product and so on. And, and interestingly, the biggest category he finds is healthcare and not finance. And it's basically because there's a lot of businesses coming up with databases for health information um, that are where, where people can actually control other people's access to their own health information. And that information is stored in a database that um, they can selectively grant access to. There's a lot of variance on that idea, um, but that's one of the more popular ideas. And there's a lot of these companies because every country in the world has their own system and health data is sort of something that's kind of both valuable and somewhat broken in, in most economies. Um, so already, hopefully, just as this intro, you, we can think about there's not just one thing here. There's lots of things. So I'll try to build up from the very beginning. I'm going to focus on the currency aspect, both that's sort of the title of the talk, but also I think it's the one that's the easiest to start wrapping your heads around. And once you've got those basics, it, you can then think more about these broader um, applications. One other comment, though, about this whole uh, application area is that you know, it, I see, I've seen you know, hundreds of, of projects come across my desk. I, I feel like a lot of those conversations where, they're, where it's my advice or where the students come back later and uh, tell me where they ended up, there's a mem on Twitter that says, you, one of these little flow charts that says, do you need a, a blockchain? And so you're expecting like a whole bunch of different things. And then there's just one arrow down and it says, no. <laughs> um, and at it, it's some level, like that's a, that's a pretty good approximation for what a, a typical a project uh, comes up at. Nonetheless, you know, I think there's, it's still incredibly interesting to think about where, where we are going to go. And it just says that you know, when, when somebody gives you a shiny new hammer, you don't necessarily immediately find the nails. And there's a lot of hammers looking for nails. But over time, as our understandings of these technologies emerge, then when use cases emerge that do fit, it'll be more like, oh, here's my problem. And oh, there's a technology that might actually fit. But, but it's much harder to start a business with a good business idea and then fit the technology rather than saying, oh, there's a shiny new object. Let me start a business that might, where that technology might be useful. And I think that's sort of the stage we're at. And that's what really came out of my cryptocurrency class in the, in the spring as well, that, that most of, even the best VCs didn't really have a lot of real solid examples going on. OK, so now let's really spend some time getting into what this thing is, building up from the beginning. So here's a picture of a ledger. Um, ledgers have been used for a very long time. Um, and 
you know, it's, we actually, sometimes your Econ 101 course, you'll hear about like early barter economies where like somebody trades an orange for an apple, but actually that was never a super common way to do business because it is kind of hard to have an orange and an apple at exactly the same time. And so, you know, through millennia, people have kept track of who has what and had some sorts of ledger systems and they've been everything from, you know, stones to marks on wood. Um, before we had paper, you know, to, to keep track of, okay, you gave somebody, you gave something, and then later on, you should get something back. And so ledgers, of course, are, are really a fundamental way to understand, um, understand money, as money is a way to make it simpler than having a ledger, because if I just give you a dollar, I don't have to go look up on a ledger, um, but it sort of serves the same purpose. You give me something now, I give you a dollar. Later on, you can use that dollar for something else. So ledgers are old. Ledgers are powerful. It really is useful to have ledgers. And the, the problem is that when we have gone to the digital economy, the cash, which sort of made it simpler than keeping track of a ledger, doesn't work in the digital world. I can't beam you a dollar. And, and, our, and our financial systems haven't really caught up to be fully um, digital so that we can move money uh, sort of as easily as we move in our information. So what is it? I'm going I'm to focus on Bitcoin just as sort of the, the kind of m biggest and, and first big innovator here. So what Bitcoin is at its core is just a big ledger. It's a big spreadsheet. Okay. So wow, how could people be so excited about a big spreadsheet? But that is what it is, a big spreadsheet. So imagine, you know, it would be convenient if you're trying to, to um, interact with people digitally to keep track of who has what. Suppose you're across countries and it's sort of hard to really, you know, move money. You could just have a big Google Doc, big Google spreadsheet, and, you know, you could have people only authorized to make entries in the spreadsheet if they had a password. And we could put a little bit of logic on top of that, which might say that, you know, your entry gets rejected if you don't have another entry in the spreadsheet. So we can have a big spreadsheet that says, and forget about how you, the, the initial conditions just for a moment, we'll come back to that, but suppose the spreadsheet starts and says, I have a Bitcoin, you have a Bitcoin, someone else has a Bitcoin, then essentially what you would want is I can log in if I have the right credentials and say, I, I'm going to make an entry that says I give a Bitcoin to someone else and we'll, we'll reject that entry if I don't have a Bitcoin. But if I have a Bitcoin and I logged in, I can make an entry that says I give it to someone else. Okay? This would be a convenient thing to do to, if we, if we you know, didn't have, weren't all in the same banking system. It would be nice just to have a big spreadsheet to keep track of who has what. And that's what Bitcoin is. That's all it is. There's a big spreadsheet. If, you, if it says that you have something and you have a password, you can log in and make another entry that says you give it to someone else. That's really the, the only functionality of this technology. Okay, so why would you be excited about that? Well, if you imagine that I was keeping you know, $50 billion worth of stuff on a big Google spreadsheet, we might have some security concerns. Okay? And if I said, oh, I'm going to spin up a server in my house on campus, and you know, I'm going to keep the, the, the copy of the spreadsheet on my server, well, I would be like a magnet for you know, attacks from all over the world. And of course, I, I want people to be able to access this, so I would have to sort of be open to the internet in some way, which would create a security nightmare. So the idea of Bitcoin is to, is to get this, this product. The product is a very simple product, which is just a spreadsheet where people can, from all over the world, make entries. But I'm going to find a way to make it secure. Okay? And I'll come back to the security. That's, of course, one of the really interesting parts. But for now, let's just imagine we have this product. I'm going to tell you more about what you would do with the product, and then we'll come back to how it works. So just to kind of get a, a, a sense of, of exactly what happens, um, again, there's a big spreadsheet, and it's going to have addresses on it. These are pseudonymous addresses, and in fact, people can have multiple addresses. Um, so if I have an ad address that's mine, the, way, the, the entry that would come to me at first would be somebody else sending me a Bitcoin and making an entry on the ledger. Then if the ledger says I have one and I have my password, what I would do is I would sit at my computer, log in, say, you know, I want to make a new entry, authenticate, 
the, entry, the new entry will be a Bitcoin goes from my address to someone else's. And so when I say log in, what I mean is that I have the credentials associated with that address that allows me to make an entry. And as long as the, the, the spreadsheet says that yes, this address received those coins in the past, it will accept the new entry to send them to something, someone else. Okay. So far, this sounds kind of fun, sort of like training, trading Beanie Babies or something. I have a Beanie Baby. I sent you a Beanie Baby. Some, you send a beanie, beanie Baby to someone else. Of course, this only is useful if, if, there, if, it's, if there's some value in having these entries on the ledger. But I want to point out that that value does not derive from the ledger itself. So we're going to be able to have markets where we buy and sell entries on the spreadsheet. But those markets are just regular old financial markets, they're not part of the basic protocol. The, the basic protocol is just this spreadsheet. So if you want to see like, how you access it, this is a screenshot of one of the early uh, wallets. And in the early days of Bitcoin, most people would sort of manage their own Bitcoins. And so the idea was that on your own computer, you would have a little piece of software that would actually download the entire history of the ledger. And then you would keep a copy of it, and actually you would join the network by, by participating, by keeping copies on your computer. Um, the, then the software would look through the whole ledger and just show you the things that are associated with, with you. And so it would simplify the whole history and say, ah, these are the transactions associated with addresses in your wallet. And so you would, have, you would put in a password to access this, and then you could do things like send and receive and keep track of contacts who would be addresses, and then you know, make little transactions, uh, uh, either receiving or sending. Okay. Um, so when this actually goes out, there's, uh, it w w what is a blockchain? It's actually a, a sequence of, uh, of you know, little, little spreadsheets that are new in additions to the ledger. And so the block, it, I, this is basically like all of it. This is what happens when you make a new entry. And so there's going to be you know, uh, a block, and then it's going to have a transaction, a fee, a size, the, the from, and the to. So that's basically all the, all the data in the protocol. So now let's start thinking about wh what you do with this and why it would even be useful. So I think the first thing I thought about as an economist, and those of you from the finance sector will I presumably had the same initial reaction, is why would you introduce a new currency? Like we have the Eurozone to avoid having lots of currencies. Any of you that work in international businesses know that like hedging exchange rate risk is like a problem. It's not something that you would choose to take on. And generally for consumers, you wouldn't want them to take exchange rate risk if they didn't need to. So if, I'm, if somebody's going to pay their rent and their taxes in dollars, you, know, you would generally not want to hold another currency unless you were using it as some sort of hedging strategy. But it wouldn't be something that you would, you would choose to do. You wouldn't just take volatility for no reason. So the first thing I said is, OK, th this sounds really cool. I really like this technology for keeping track of, of who has what. But why do it in, in, in this thing called a Bitcoin? Why not do it in dollars? So why not have a big spreadsheet that says who has which dollars. And the key insight for that is that actually we can't put dollars on a spreadsheet directly. So just, just imagine we have this spreadsheet technology. We could certainly put a message on it that says, you sent me a dollar. And I could make another message that says, I send you a dollar. But what would that really mean? Because I didn't beam you a dollar. Like there's a message on a spreadsheet that says, I sent you a dollar but I can't actually send you a dollar on a spreadsheet. Okay. I could have messages that say, I promise to give you a dollar, um, but I can't actually send a dollar on a spreadsheet. And that's really core to understanding what could, what could possibly be new and different from a sort of currency or asset perspective is that the definition of a Bitcoin is the entry on the spreadsheet. So if I authenticate sending a Bitcoin to you, you have the Bitcoin. It's not an IOU for a Bitcoin. It's not a promise that to, to obey a contract and give you a Bitcoin. It's actually the Bitcoin. The entire definition of the asset is the entry on a spreadsheet. Well, if I put a dollar on a spreadsheet, because dollars are not digital, they're, um, I can't actually send you a dollar uh, literally on this spreadsheet. And of course, those of you from finance will 
will be familiar that in some sense, like when you're, when you're doing, moving money internationally, you don't think about dollars and euros. It actually, those dollars and euros live in a bank. So there's like Citibank dollars or JP Morgan dollars. Because if you were moving around the world, the way that you go through dollars is to hold accounts in a bank. Um, and, and if you go from country to country, you might go from a, a smaller bank to Citibank, then Citibank would make an internal ledger transfer themselves to an, a, foreign, um, a, a, a foreign bank where they have an account. Um, and then you would make another transfer from a, the, that foreign account to a smaller bank in that country. And so what we really have when we look digitally are IOUs. When you open up Bank of America in the morning and look at your, your balance, you say, oh, well, I have digital money. Well, you don't actually have digital money. You have an IOU from Bank of America. Bank of America promises that if you send a transfer, they'll, they'll make a back-end transfer. But they actually cannot promise you to do whatever you want with it. If you said, I want to send it to North Korea, they would block it. If you sent a bunch of transactions for $9,999 over and over again, uh, they would block it. Okay, and we've seen various politicians get uh, caught up with that type of problem. Um, so, you know, they, it, they, it's an IOU that is subject to the rules and regulations of a particular country. And so it can't actually be, I, I can hit send, but I don't know that it, the money will go. And in fact, internationally, about 5% of wires fail, the money gets lost. So you hit send, but it doesn't actually receive. So any com countries, companies that have a big supply chain will have a whole little department of like failed wire transfer chaser downers. Um, to deal with that problem. So an asset that like this is, of course, it's an interesting asset and it works for most purposes, but it is fundamentally different from an asset where when I make the entry on the spreadsheet, it's done. Okay? It's good and bad. If you're a consumer and you type in the wrong address in Bitcoin and you hit send, it is gone. Okay? There is no 1-800-BITCOIN to reverse it. Um, you made the entry, the entry is permanent, it is there, it is there forever. If I, if I sent a transaction to Silk Road when I was a, a, a college student and, you know, and everybody knew what the Silk Road address is, that is also permanently on the record. Okay, so if somebody could associate that Bitcoin address with me, then forever you would know that I was sending money to Silk Road when I was 21. So these things are permanent, irrevocable, and actually on the Bitcoin ledger, public. And in fact, in some of my research a few years ago, I went in and you know, analyzed the, the blockchain and you could see what people were doing and how many people were gambling and how many people were going to Silk Road. You could figure out what time zone they were in by when they made the transactions. Um, and for people who had ever like, posted on the web their Bitcoin address, you could figure out them and you could figure out their friends and so on. So it's actually like a pretty, in some ways, a pretty un, unsafe uh, way for, to, to do things because you don't you usually value your financial privacy. Um, and you have no recourse if you type in the wrong number. Also, if you lose your password, this is a problem. So in the early days, and there was a Big Bang Theory episode about this that kind of formalized a bunch of my friends' experience. I had lots of computer science friends and early people toying around with Bitcoin in you know, 2011, 12. The things were worth like a cent or you know, two cents or 10 cents, and then they, then they get up to a you know, dollar, $10. You know, then it, in last uh, December, they are $18,000. And you're like, wait, what happened to that laptop? Uh, what happened to my password? You know, imagine like trying to go back and find something that was, you know, on a laptop in 2012, and there were a lot of sad people, um, <laughs> because you can look at the blockchain and you can say, oh, those bitcoins are mine, but you can never get them back. You know, so there there are lots of people who are like, you know, multimillionaires or on, on paper, but just can't get the the coins. So it's an, it's, so I've, now I've got, those are like all the negatives, but of course there's also some positives. If you think about it in a business context, wouldn't it be nice sometimes to make a transaction and like 10 minutes later have it be done and there's no rollback? Because then you could make another transaction on top of that and another one on top of that. And you could have computer programs do those transactions and you would have the certainty that they took place. So that is a, a, just a different characteristic of these assets that is really not, cannot, by, by kind of regulation, cannot be provided by the existing financial system from consumer protection, anti money laundering, all that stuff, will not allow a bank to really offer that service. So it's just different. Okay, 
So now let's talk a little bit about what you would do with this. Um, and also, that'll bring up the idea of how these things are actually valued. So suppose I was, uh, my kid was doing a Skype lesson. Actually, one of my kids now is taking Python over Skype, uh, which is a very convenient thing to do. And you, know, you can get a teacher in Silicon Valley. It's hard to hire someone to do anything for less than you know, $100 an hour. But uh, you, know, you can get someone who lives somewhere else who's a nice, uh, starving computer science student who can teach Python to my child for a much more reasonable price. So you know, you do the, you're doing some sort of Skype lesson, but suppose the teacher is, is actually somewhere else. Or maybe you're learning a language, Japanese or Mandarin, and your tutor is in another country. You would like to pay them uh, right away. If they're in another country, if I wanted to send them directly peer-to-peer -peer wire transfer, that might cost me $50 or $60, which is large relative to the cost of a lesson. Now, platforms and so on will try to make that easier for you. But even actually like Airbnb and Uber and so on, are actually very upset about the state of the current financial system because it's so expensive for them to facilitate these payments around the world. So they're actually some of the big movers in pushing for improvements. So if I wanted to do this just peer to peer, if the recipient actually was understood the way that Bitcoin works, I could do the following thing. I would open up an account on a, on a company, say like Coinbase or um, Bitstamp. And these are companies, they are not part of Bitcoin, they're just startup companies. And what they, the service they provide is a, a place where you can send fiat currency and then do trading on their system. And so they just have simple software that creates an order book in every currency. So I transfer in my dollars using like an ACH transfer or a, a wire transfer to get my dollars there. Once my dollars are there, then I can just place a limit order or a market order to say, hey, I want to buy a Bitcoin. And some people want to sell Bitcoins, and they have nice little visualizations. In fact, the software that for this is so easy that I talked to a, a, a startup who set up an exchange over a weekend. You know, there's basically just off-the-shelf software. This is not rocket science to do the really basic part. Of course, the security is another problem, but the, the basic software is easy. So then if I say I want to buy some Bitcoin, what will happen is that that exchange will then you know, f find the place where the bids and asks cross, make the exchange, and, and suddenly I'll be the owner of a Bitcoin. Now, what I can do with that Bitcoin then is, it, at that point, the exchange is still holding the Bitcoin themselves. So they're still in custody. If the, big, if the exchange went out of business right that minute, I'd be out of luck. And that used to happen quite a bit. Now there are some more um, you know, well-established companies with governance and real engineers and things like that. So, so, so one of these more established ones, I'm not real worried about them going out of business in the next five minutes. So then I have the Bitcoin, and I can then send a transfer to the, Bitcoin, the receiver's Bitcoin wallet, and that can take place in about 10 minutes. So I say, please send, then their wallet would receive that, and then we could just get off the Skype call, they've been paid, we're done. Okay? That's a very nice feature that you really cannot get across borders anywhere else. Now, what do they do once they have it? Well, they could take the Bitcoin and buy a cup of coffee or buy something online, but if they wanted to actually turn it back into yen, then they could transfer, send the Bitcoin onto an exchange, and it might be a Japanese exchange, which would receive the Bitcoin. Then they could place an order to sell. The Japanese exchange would give them some yen, and then they could use the Japanese uh, uh, internal country uh, transfer systems to put it into their bank account. Okay? So this is how you could do this, and this stuff happens all the time. It's a very common uh, thing to, to do, especially for these small value transactions. People use it to pay programmers in Venezuela or all sorts of other use cases. Now, there's a few problems with this. First of all, this is kind of high friction. This is not like you know, simple consumer product. You're exposed to exchange rate volatility along the way. Now, that exchange rate volatility might not much be much within a day, although like over Christmas, and I was caught up in this as well because I was holding and was trying to sell, you know, you, you, like the price might move 5% or 10% in the course of a day. So you had to like be there at your computer trying to get this stuff done and not like be lazy about it. Um, but generally in a given day, it doesn't move that much. And you also have to worry about these, these exchanges going out of business. Um, one thing that doesn't matter is the level of the exchange rate. So this thing works as well when Bitcoin is $100 a Bitcoin as it is $18,000 a Bitcoin, because I'm just getting in and getting out. So all those exchange rates will move in concert. I don't really care how high it is. What I do need is transaction volume, because in the early days, you know, when it was not that popular, you would, the spreads would be high, and so you would, you would lose a lot on the bid-ask spread. Today, um, you know, there might be 
just even Ripple, which I'm going to talk about later, uh, you know, we'll, we were having lots of $4 billion days, so $4 billion of transaction volume over the holidays. And then more recently, it's been about you know, a half a billion dollars a day. So that's more than a lot of stocks. And so that, that means these are actually like fairly liquid relative to stocks. And that's important for making this work. Nonetheless, you, this is really not a great consumer product. And the way this is, would end up getting mass marketed would be that a company would do this for you and the consumer really wouldn't see it. So the consumer would have an app and just say, I want to send money to Japan, and the app would implement this on the back end. And there are a number of products all over the world that, that try to do that. Now, there's a few additional concepts that, that become interesting here. It's like once you understand all of that, you realize that actually these exchanges are kind of a big source of friction and a source of risk. So what you might want to do instead is have a, a decentralized exchange where this is all done in software so that all of the transactions go one after the other. And so V1 of this was actually Ripple in 2013. So this is what their software looked like then. They built an, uh, sort of a new version of Bitcoin that was similar in some ways and different in others. But one of the ways that it was different is it actually built into the protocol the ability to have market makers make bids and asks, as well as a pathfinding algorithm that would say, if I want to send something to Japan, it's going to find a sequence of trades I can make to get me from the dollars to the yen uh, automatically. So it's the same thing as this previous picture, except for it all happens at once through software. So there might be a market maker making a market between XRP, their currency, and dollars. There might be another market maker making an offer between yen and XRP. They would plug into an API, and those market makers would commit that if someone took their bids and offers, then the, 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 the transaction would go through. They wouldn't have to manually approve. It would just be a standing offer. And so you could just take it and execute that in three seconds. So this is what the, the V1 of Ripple did, and that was its differentiating thing. And I thought at the time, this was really a big improvement because I was generally thinking consumers would not want to hold a cryptocurrency themselves. So if I wanted to think about utility, this would be a better way. So um, this would, and now there's, a, there's a, a bunch of V2s of this coming out now called decentralized exchanges that on other protocols and platforms are trying to implement this idea. Um, what, the interesting thing that happened with Ripple is that they went out and tried to sell this to banks and said, hey, banks, you might want to use a system like this to move money across borders. And some banks were interested, but actually a lot of banks said, hey, we're a little worried about this cryptocurrency thing. It's got regulatory risks, and it's going to take some time to figure it out. But we love this idea, so could you do this for us, but without the cryptocurrency? And then you actually realize that, wow, yeah, like, why didn't we do this before? Like, we should have done this without the cryptocurrency before. And you might ask, why don't we do it today? And the answer is, you know, it's not about the technology. It's about the, we all use Swift, and we're all stuck, and we have software systems that are used to an old way of doing things, and we just haven't advanced. So my economist friends say, well, couldn't we just fix that? And I'm like, yeah, they are. <laughs> That's what we're doing. So you know, Ripple introduced in something called an interledger protocol, which basically takes this idea of a decentralized exchange. And it's a protocol that basically will say, if I want to get money from one end to the other, there might be a bunch of middlemen, market makers, and people who have accounts in multiple banks. I'm gonna, they're all going to make offers onto this protocol. And then if I want to get money from A to B, we're going to have a protocol that ensures the money instantly goes from A to B, but it never gets stuck in the middle. And like, that's a really nice thing, because in today's system, you tend to have delays and have things get stuck in the middle. So the bottom line of how this is getting used is that banks are basically plugging in. And we have, there's a big group in the Middle East. There's also a big group in Asia. Um, a big group of Japanese banks have, have just joined. So a lot of smaller countries are the early adopters. And they're setting up their own networks so they don't have to go through SWIFT. Because SWIFT is uh, you know, somewhat archaic. And it also tend, it, it doesn't, it, go, it goes slowly. Their messaging doesn't work very well. And then the smaller countries also feel they're very disadvantaged um, because it's sort of everything is going through a few large US institutions. So in terms of the future of currency, in some sense, part of the role of the US dollar has been to be a hub currency in a hub and spoke system. But with these new technologies, the smaller countries don't have to go through that hub. Anybody who flies an airline through a hub knows that you pay a higher price. 
um, and it can be slow, and the airlines kind of exact monopoly power over you when they have control of hub. And, in, and the smaller banks and countries feel the same way about their relationship with the large US banks that, that where they have to pay markups and f face delays as they go over that system. So they're able to basically create a peer-to-peer -peer network that allows them to move money instantly among themselves without having to go through that. Now, a, a set of those, um, actually, I'm going to, uh, a set of those, um, those uh, countries are also using the cryptocurrency. Right now, it's mostly remittance providers. So there's a company called Qualix that's doing it US to Mexico. Um, and there's a, 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 a association of 1,400 US credit unions that's doing it to help the, the credit unions access international markets. And so it's kind of coming up from the bottom from the smaller players who aren't well served. All right. So um, let me now say a couple of quick words about mining, just so that you won't walk away not understanding how this is. So this all started with this anonymous white paper, Bitcoin, a peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash system. And basically what they wanted to accomplish was a worldwide network of what we call weekly identified parties to reach consensus on the contents of the ledger. So you might ask, why would you want this? And I think actually a lot of us would still ask that if you were using a commercial implementation. But let's just take for a second what they, what they wanted to accomplish was kind of intellectually mind boggling. I'm going to, we said before, we've got these copies of the ledger, we want to decentralize them, but I've got to provide security somehow. So how are you going to do that? And their idea was to allow people to join the network when you had no idea who they were, no way to know, no way to verify. Anybody can join, uh, college kids, people in any part of the world you know, uh, can join this network and can help keep track of what the truth is, okay? If you're gonna ask that anybody in the world can join and keep track of what the truth is, you're gonna have to figure out some way to make it costly to join. And that is part of what, um, what this, this, uh, this whole system does. So the Nakamoto consensus says that we can let anybody in the world join and keep track of the ledger, but if they disagree, we're going to use majority voting to say which one is the right one. So if I can join the network and, and say I'm keeping copy of the ledger, my temptation would be to put another entry that says, everybody just gave all their Bitcoins to me. That would be fun. And if I can keep a copy of the ledger, why wouldn't I do that? Well, the answer is that everybody has to vote majority rule over whether that's the right thing and nobody else would want to approve that um, transaction. So because I wouldn't have authorized it, I wouldn't have, ha I wouldn't have followed the rules to do that. So it's voting, um, and you're going to have majority rule. Now, the immediate thing you think of was, wait, if it's voting, why don't I just set up 100,000 computers and have them all vote for me? Okay, that's, and that is, in fact, possible. Now, the way that you avoid that is, are a couple of things. First of all, if I set up 100,000 computers and made them all give the money to me, then the prices and the markets might crash. So I might not really get anything out of that. And that is one of the, part, the, the key things that's keeping it secure. It's actually an economic incentive. If I tried to vote, break the system by creating a lot of computers and giving all the Bitcoin to me, I wouldn't be able to sell them because nobody would want to buy them because they just broke the system. So it's really an economic incentive model. It's not a cryptographic breakthrough. It is economic incentives. That's very interesting about this. The, the, but the second way that they, they, they do this is they make it expensive to join. So you can't just join and, and, and create the ledger. You have to actually pay a fee. Okay. But the problem is we're all over the world. We just said we don't have an international banking system that really works particularly well. And you know, these people, um, might we don't even know who they are. So how could I you know, get money from them? So I want them to pay to join the network, but I don't have a great way to collect cash from them. So the solution is, you have to burn money to join the network. That's the solution. Now, if I literally had you burn cash, you might worry about how do I know that you really burn the cash? I could doctor a video of me burning cash and say, hey, I'm burning cash, let me join the network. But that might, need, that might be hard to verify. So they had to figure out a way to burn cash to join the network in a way you could tell unambiguously that you burn the cash. Okay? So what's the solution to that? They set up this very hard prop math problem that's using cryptography, basically, where the, to solve the math problem, the only way you can solve it is to keep guessing. So every 10 minutes, this system is going to pose a question. And then all around the world, people guess the answer to it. And so the way that you, and, and so you can then use electricity and computing power to keep generating guesses and guesses and guesses and guesses. 
And the only way you'd ever get a right answer is if, on average, is that if you burned a lot of, of energy. So the, the barrier to entry, the analog of burning money, is to burn electricity. And the way it's credible is that I only reward you if you actually solve the problem. And on average, you can only do that if you burn a lot of electricity. So that is the system. A bunch of people burning money all over the world for the right to vote, on, on which is the right system. But it, it, I just want to reemphasize that is an economic breakthrough, not actually a cryptography breakthrough. Um, and then what, ha what happened over time is that actually it, can, chips were invented who, they, whose only thing they're good at is to solve these problems just for Bitcoin. So there's a whole industry developing chips just for Bitcoin. Then there are, there are server farms that are now very um, you know, streamlined and efficient that buy these chips, make the server farms, and then solve these math problems and try to get the rewards. So it's actually like a very, the, the people responded to their economic incentives to create mining farms uh, very quickly. And it's a bit of an arms race because you actually can't be profitable at it unless you're using cheap energy in the latest chips. Otherwise, you burn more energy than the rewards that you get. Um, so now we have a distributed ledger with a bunch of people burning money, all keeping copies of it, and we've achieved the security we were looking for. Now it's turned out because of the economics, there's been a lot of concentration in that. Like you can, it's economies of scale, so it's better to be a big network. And so we do actually have more concentration, and people still worry about the control of a small number of groups. Um, and in addition, this money burning has really gotten quite expensive. So it didn't seem like a big deal when you were sort of a bunch of people playing around with the science project. But right now, Bitcoin consensus costs about $10,000 per minute and accounts for about 0.1% of world energy consumption. So it's actually very expensive to burn that energy. And then people are out there thinking about alternatives. Are there ways to get all these benefits without having to burn so much money? It ranges from trying to do something productive with your electricity instead of solving this useless math problem to other things like proof of stake, where you get to vote if you have some commitment to the ecosystem. And, and then a third solution is to actually not just let anybody join. So, um, and that, you sort of think, I'm burning 0.1% of US energy consumption just because I wanted to have the feature that anybody in the world could join anonymously. Maybe if I restricted energy a little, uh, entry a little bit, I wouldn't have to do that. So um, finally, I'll just mention that uh, one of the cool things you can do with Bitcoin is to create software that moves this money. So in a typical escrow system for buying a house, you would have a central party who keeps everything, checks if certain conditions are met, and distributes the funds, while smart escrow is, like a, is a simple example of a smart contract. It's a piece of software that can hold on to funds check the state of the world. Was there a hurricane? Did the stock price go up? Did something else change? And as a result of that, in a state contingent way, distribute the assets. So I could hedge a risk around the world. I could place a bet with anybody without having to trust them, know them, or pay a bank to act as a middleman just by running up a piece of software. And that software is available at scale. There are platforms for creating that software so people can create these types of, of contracts and, and, and allow new things to happen. And that's one of the big areas of innovation. So I think I will stop here and open up for questions. Um, and yeah, we can take it any direction. There's lots of places we haven't gone yet about the value of the currency. Anything else? So let, let's open up to questions now. Uh, and then we got mics coming around. So up here. Yes. Can you talk a little bit about the future of energy consumption and all this data mining? Yeah, so I, I mean, I think it's a big problem. And at some level, you know, if, 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 you, if you said, oh, is a country going to try to use Bitcoin for their national currency, or are we really going to see something like this used at scale? I think that the, this energy consumption, money burning thing is just a fatal defect from having it really get big as a transaction mechanism. And so when, when you talk to countries, uh, some countries are thinking about getting rid of cash entirely. Like um, England is advanced in that. Some of the Scandinavian countries are thinking about that. And they have thought about, can we use this technology to have a fiat currency, but, but just not have cash, have it be purely digital. But none of them are seriously thinking about, you know, I'm going to have this kind of proof of work, energy burning thing to run a national system. They would instead sort of limit entry like manually. You would have a distributed system, but you kind of have to have permission to join, and then you don't have to burn the money in the same kind of way. Uh, yeah, is there? So my understanding from the regulatory uh, standpoint is the central banks will tolerate this as long as it's marginal. 
but the idea that you can move very large sums of money, which ultimately is fiat money, across borders is not something they're going to tolerate when it gets to scale. So that's a great question. So there's, I think it's really important to separate two use cases. So one is the consumer to consumer use case, like over Skype. And that, I think, is very threatening as to high inflation countries that have a lot of capital controls. Um, and I, basically, I would like go short any country that is dependent on capital controls, by the way, because you can't put this genie back in the bottle. Like, this technology is out there, and there are privacy-preserving versions of it. So essentially, you just cannot keep your capital in your country at scale in the future. But the, the concern about that is one reason they would clamp down. Of course, other things are sort of anti-money laundering and so on. Now, the business to this is one reason I'm more interested in the business to business case, which is sort of what Ripple is doing. Because in that case, nothing changes in terms of the regulatory framework. The consumer never touches it. The consumer is still going through the same financial institutions. And the financial institutions are just doing it on the back end. And for that use case, actually, the central banks of smaller countries are incredibly enthusiastic. They're actually pushing their countries forward. Because as a, just a, as a matter of national policy, having your entire country dependent on you know, paying markups to Citibank is a bad thing. And you, know, you also have sub, subject to regulatory risk. Like the US can change regulations, which can make it harder for certain countries to move money where they want to move it. So from that perspective, getting this sort of peer-to-peer kind of regional networks, the central banks are actually incredibly enthusiastic. What they want, I think, is they don't, they're, they're sort of happy to go to a new technology. They just want to make sure that, that they still have the normal gateways. And so that, I think, is a much more promising avenue. Nonetheless, they're still thinking more about the technological solution. And only some of them have really embraced cryptocurrency as, as a conduit, as a, as a hub currency. So in your opinion, uh, which uh, uh, cryptocurrency has actually tried to solve the flaws of Bitcoin, uh, or which is the most advanced? That's part one. Part two is that, um, is there a better model available than burning energy that can cure of, it, of, that, of the fundamental flaw in all these mechanisms? So this is a very deep question, and you could read you know, thousands of pages on Reddit of people arguing about this. So I, I, will, I will say a few kind of comments, but I, I cannot claim to have all the answers. So when I first started talking about alternative cryptocurrencies in, say, 2013, and I was involved with Ripple very early, there was a whole set of people, including some of our famous tech leaders in Silicon Valley, who would stand up and say, you know, scale economies, you know, the, the best thing doesn't always win. Bitcoin was first. Bitcoin, 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 everything is going to be Bitcoin. These other things are all going to die. I would stand up and quietly raise my hand and say, well, you know, if you're thinking about enterprise software, it's not all just like the Betamax and VHS and, you know, Netscape versus IE. In fact, in enterprise software, you typically have a lot of different vertical solutions serving different parts of the market with different combinations of features. And so my thought was that we will see different systems for different purposes. And in fact, that is sort of how that's evolved. So I don't think there's one size fits all. So Ripple wants to move you know, hundreds of billions of dollars or, or trillions of dollars between banks internationally. So they need a highly scalable system that is, and these proof of work stuff is just a, a complete non-starter. So they have sort of, in some sense, controlling who, who keeps track of the ledgers. And they also have software that allows you to just move things without even touching the cryptocurrency. So you wouldn't even really call it a cryptocurrency solution. For that use case, that is what's taking off. And the other things are not taking off so much. For developers, you, know, you, might, you, you might want a, a cryptocurrency that actually has the ability, more, more ability to write software embedded in the protocol. And so Ethereum has gone a lot in that direction in terms of making it easy for people to build software on top of Ethereum. So Ethereum is almost thinking of itself like an operating system, really. And so that's good for that. There are coins that preserve financial privacy. So there are coins that actually do everything that Bitcoin does, and there's still a big ledger, but nobody from the outside can look at it and, and reconstruct the network of who sent what to whom. If you're trying to evade capital controls or do money laundering, 
that's your currency. You know, that looks great. Um, and, and of course, consumers might have an interest in financial privacy, even if they're doing legitimate things, because if, they, if you can see on the network that you hold a lot of cryptocurrency, you're actually vulnerable to kidnapping and all sorts of other things. And you're more vulnerable with crypto because the money can move across borders so fast. So you can, you're at risk of theft in a way that you're not forced the money that's stored in a bank. So I would just say like they're, they're different. And, and I don't think it's going to be one size fits all. I don't think there's going to be 1,000, but there may be 15 or 10 that you know, actually each solve a different use case better. And the biggest problem right now is we actually have very little product market fit. There's, not, there's hardly any actual use cases where this thing is really doing a great job. So trying to make it one size fits all just makes that problem harder rather than easier. But this is a very controversial thing. And, if, and there's, uh, to top it out, there's all these tw Twitter bots that are trying to make people buy and sell currencies, starting just like the, in the election, you know, we had these Twitter bots that cre created division and tried to make everybody hate each other. Well, the crypto space has all these bots that try to make everybody hate each other and troll each other. Um, so it's really just kind of a, a wild west in terms of the conversation on that topic. We keep hearing about tokens all the time these days. Where do tokens fit into all of this? Well, so, I mean, the, the, the Bitcoin is the token for that uh, ecosystem, and you know, XRP is the token for the, XR, the, the ledger. Um, I think one of the ways people are kind of like this have this idea of a token economy, and since I'm actually really a marketplace expert, this crypto thing is a relatively new thing, but you know, some, I, I'm on the boards of Lending Club and Expedia and Rover, which are marketplaces. So I've got a lot of people coming into my office pitching me these like marketplace economies, where the idea is that, oh, you give your medical data, then somebody's going to pay you in a token. You hold the token. Now you want to get other people to join the system so your token will get more valuable. And then that will grow. Or the, the tokens might also replace like frequent flyer miles or other types of ideas. So there's all these ideas about sort of businesses that are built on top of blockchains with tokens that are specific to the business. And then there becomes a little economy in those tokens and everybody wants to make it grow and they're all invested in the success of the business. So, you know, in some level, that's how Bitcoin started. So you can't say that the idea doesn't make any sense, and it, it can make sense. But the hard part with all of those things is just getting them started. You know, they all face a chicken and egg problem. And unless you have a good business, you know, those tokens are just nothing. But it's a very hot topic for entrepreneurs. Yeah, I'm still really confused about the whole voting business when it comes to the, uh, the all the different ledgers, the different versions. I mean, what actually happens if, if my computer actually keeps a ledger and a new transaction comes in, how does my computer either accept or reject that transaction as a legitimate transaction? So if you are, if, if like, there's, this is kind of confusing because they're sort of in equilibrium and out of equilibrium. So like when the system is working, then there's just software that you would run, and it would say, here's a new batch of transactions. It would check a set of rules. So like, was this person authorized to make the transaction? Did they have the Bitcoin, and so on. And so in that state of the world, the software just checks a set of things and, and then accepts or rejects it. So there's no problem. So what's, what makes it more confusing is if you think about some sort of out of equilibrium behavior, which could take a whole bunch of different forms, but they all would have the same idea of putting things on the ledger that didn't follow the rules. And so that's the case that where you know, other people would say, hey, my, my copy doesn't look like your copy. And if they're following the rules, they would just say, well, I don't know what happened, but you must have made a mistake. We're going to do the same thing as everybody else. I checked, and I agree. So he checked, and he agrees. All good. We just keep going. So these, these attacks are the things that are sort of could, could take a variety of different forms. Could you speak a little bit more about blockchain for good, specifically like VeChain for vaccine authentication or other healthcare applications? Sure. So, and there's again a, a whole variety of them. A lot of them are nascent. Um, I, I think one uh, one idea that I think does have legs is trying to follow supply chains in complex settings. So, if you're the Gates Foundation and you're trying to move money around Africa. You know, you give the money, and there's this whole leakage along the way, and a lot of stuff isn't digital, and there's a lot of corruption, so it's hard to f make sure it got where it was going. So one thing you can imagine happening, and it's certainly been discussed, is that some big institution, whether it's like the World Bank or the Gates Foundation or someone else that's really big, could sort of force their supply chain to um, track funds through a distributed ledger. 
And that might be useful because the people you're dealing with don't actually have identities. Like you actually have to use suppliers who you really can't verify. And the countries themselves don't have good legal institutions and so on. So that's a good use of the blockchain. If it's, a, if it's just funds, you could just see them going from one person to the other. And, and they would be dispersed, you know, split up as you go along. So a big block grant here, and then it's dispersed and dispersed and dispersed. But you would have a, a ledger that keeps track of that until the very end. Another way that you can do that is with physical goods. And there you get into this challenge of how do you keep track of this physical good. But the, the really simple version of the idea is there's some kind of barcode that's really embedded in the good that you can't take out easily. And you scan it at the beginning. And then as it moves along, it's scanned again. And every time it moves from party to party, that triggers funds being released as well as a record of what happened. And again, we, we already have IT systems to do that today. It works great inside a firm, but it doesn't work so well if you're going across countries in Africa or someplace that doesn't have good systems. So those are some of the applications that might get donors to give more money or make things more efficient. And then other types of things, I mean, the vaccines, like maybe there's, there's uh, counterfeit vaccines. So you might want to scan the vaccine at the factory and see that this is an authentic vaccine. And then at the end, you could tell that it was real. And people have also talked about it for just counterfeit luxury goods in China. Uh, you know, there have been versions of those businesses that don't involve blockchains. And when you really dig into it, you might say, well, do I really need, I don't need the full Bitcoin. I just need a database. I just need a database of access. So the question still arise of like, what's the best way to do that? What's the very best technological system to manage a supply chain? Do you have any estimates of how much illicit versus legal transactions are going on in the uh, cryptocurrency space? Yeah, so in the various people have analyzed this at various points in time. So my own analysis is a bit dated now because it was mostly 2015 and 2016. So by far the biggest thing that people are doing with these things is day trading and like holding them. So I was actually excited to look at all the stuff people were doing, but most people are just not doing anything. You know, they bought them, they held them, and then the price went up and they sold them, or they're just trading them a lot. So most of the volume is just on and off exchanges, and they're not actually doing all these great things that we imagined they would do. Um, the, uh, now, of course, all that liquidity can make it cheaper for someone to build a real business. And so like the US to Mexico, the fact that there's all these day traders makes it really cheap for a remittance provider to get in and out of, say, XRP going to Mexico, the fact that there's a lot of trading volume. But that's the main thing they're doing. And then among the things where you could identify what they were doing, yes, yeah, Silk Road was big, gambling was big, you know. But in some sense, that's just sort of like in the early days, there's just not really much to do with it, you know. One of, you know, like you, you're, you're, you want to just have fun. So you're just kind of doing things for fun. You're buying coffee because it's cool, not because you really need to. So it's hard to kind of draw inferences from, from that very nascent, uh, time period. Um, so I, I think, though, you know, go. So re right now, really, like, no, people aren't using it at scale, period. Um, but the, the, these illicit use cases are one use case that where there's not a better alternative today, and that's partly why that's like an actual use case. Thanks so much, everybody, for coming. Yeah.